so my name is Gail Krikorian. Uh, I'm working as an advisor for the Greens at the European Parliament. So the Greens uh, is a small political group with uh, between 50 and 60 members. We just you know, had the election and a new, new parliament, so we don't know yet exactly how many members we have, but so it's going to be between 50 and 60 out of 700 and something. So we're a small group, but uh, we still manage to do some, some things. Uh, and I'm advising uh, the, the MEPs on intellectual property issues and access to knowledge. So I want to talk today about this issue of uh, uh, trade secrets, because as uh, Sean was mentioning, it's an issue that is uh, now emerging for us. Um, I will start with the beginning. Uh, so my intention is to just provide a little, you know, some basic information uh, from the perspective of our, our perspective in Europe, you know, on this topic, and uh, give you a sense of uh, the way we as Greens are approaching it now. Because of course, as Sean was saying, you know, it's new to us. It's something new, and we just uh, start to realize how important it, it is, and and all the potential risk that could come with uh, changes uh, in this field. So to start with the beginning, what does trade secret covers? Cover, sorry. So in general, trade secret, you know, the basic definition is it's, it's not known to the public, or it's secret. It has commercial value because it is secret, and, you know, the owner of this uh, secret has, take, has uh, has taken a reasonable uh, effort to keep it secret. So that's the general framework, and as you can imagine, so it's very broad. It can be many, many, many different things. And I think that's, so this is a couple of examples, and it's to give you a sense of the diversity of uh, things we're talking about. It's the most famous example is the Coca-Cola formula. Okay. So it's any type of formula, you know, perfume, cosmetic, whatever. But it can be, you know, the design for a prototype car, car tire. It can be know-how to produce uh, bio, biologic drugs. It can be management uh, technique uh, in different services, a concept for a TV show, governmental information, but also personal information, uh, sensitive business ideas that you know are at stage too early to get uh, regular intellectual property rights. So many, many different things. Uh, I think it's important to see that because you know then uh, many people who work on different things understand or start to understand how maybe you know they should take an interest in trade secrets. So what is the situation in Europe now? Uh, we uh, we have a very complicated situation in a sense because uh, there is no European law at this point. So what we have uh, is national laws on trade secrets. I think it's a little bit uh, as it is in the, in the US, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I think there are states law, but there is no uh, uh, federal law on, on trade secrets. And so in Europe, what happened is that a lot of, uh, so everybody has a protection, some form, you know, of protection of trade secrets, but it is under very different legal framework and very different uh, piece of national legislation. So <coughs> Sweden is the only country where there is a specific trade secret law since uh, 1990. <coughs> Now, in Italy and Portugal, it is uh, a provision in the code for industrial property. In France, it is under intellectual property. And that's the only country in Europe where it is considers, considered as intellectual property rights, which is, you know, interesting to note. I think in the US, you consider that as intellectual property, and it's a property regime. But it's not the case in, uh, in most countries in Europe. So Australia, Germany, Poland, Spain, it's under unfair competitive provisions. In other countries, it is in their labor laws and civil codes. Netherlands and uh, Luxembourg, it's, uh, it, they rely on tort law. And UK and Ireland, it's a common law of confidence and by, by contract. So you see a very big diversity of situation. <coughs> Of course, all EU countries are compliant with the WTO requirements. And this is what is, uh, you know, setting in, uh, in the TRIPS agreement, uh, what trade, I mean, the, the, the framework for the protection of, of trade secrets. As you can see, it's, it's not per se mentioning trade secrets. It is saying, so it's referring to the Paris Convention, and it is saying that 
natural and legal person share the possibility of preventing information lawfully within their control from being disclosed to, acquired by, or used by others without their consent in a manner contrary to honest commercial practice. Uh, so long that, you know, as I was saying before, it is secret, there is a commercial value because it is secret, and reasonable step to keep it secret. So, you see, that's the general uh, requirement, uh, international rules under that anybody has to fulfill and that, uh, that, that you know, is being uh, uh, implemented in Europe, country by country. Now we have a lot of pressure in Europe to adopt an harmonization uh, legislation. And so we are now working, I mean, we were just before the election and we're going to start again to work on an harmonization directive that was, as usual, you know, drafted by the European Commission. And very recently we got a position from the European Council on it. So I'm not going into the details, the nitty gritty of how Europe is functioning, but you know, we have those three bodies, European Commission, European Council, and European Parliament. And the legislation is going to be the, you know, the conclusion of the negotiation between those two, three institutions the European Commission being the one that starts the debate by you know, providing a draft uh, for the directive. So we have this draft now uh, that we are studying and, and we got this position from the European Council very early in the process which gives us an indication that there is somewhere strong political uh, pressure to adopt legislation very soon. Uh, one of the reasons for that, as we understand it, is that uh, trade secret is one is presented as a priority both by the US and the EU in the context of the TTIP negotiations. So of course, um, although things are not that reasonable all the time, but uh, for the European Commission, you know, to negotiate the TRIPS agreements on trade secrets, they have to be a European position. Uh, since we do not have yet uh, European legislation, they have to, 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 to make one. So that's what we are doing. So why is it, I mean, so the, the, the plan is to try to get this directive uh, finalized by the end of the year, uh, which is very ambitious because usually, you know, it's, uh, it's a long process and when it's a, n a new topic, because it's new to everybody, you know, in the parliament, well, usually it takes some time, so here they want to go fast. We'll see if it works. And another question that we are asking ourselves is why is it a priority in the context of TTIP? And we don't have clear answers about that. So, but what we see is that uh, there may be, you know, as much, the more we understand what trade secrets are and what they cover, and the more we see potential risk of misuse or, or abuses of trade secret protections. Not that we are paranoiac, I think, but I think <laughs> we got used, you know, working on intellectual property to see, you know, some things being um, going on. So we're trying to identify, you know, even for us, you know, to, to, to comprehend, to, to, to work on this matter, trying to, to see what are the type of risk, you know, that uh, you know, we should take into consideration. What are the type of problems uh, that we can, uh, we can foresee? And to do that, we are looking at what is already existing with trade secrets. So I, I hear you have a couple of examples that, are, uh, that come from the US. So one of the big problems with trade secrets, you know, abuse of trade secrets, because I think trade secret per se is not a problem, but the problem would be you know, abuse of that notion. Um, it is that it is used to bypass disclosure obligation, transparency policies, to undermine environmental or consumer protection regulations. So here you have a couple of examples. There is the example of the fracking uh, in North Carolina. You know, if you want to do fracking, you have to get a permit, and to have a permit, you have to disclose the kind of chemical you're using. So the fracking companies are trying to use, they're making the case, you know, that this is trade secret, so they don't have to reveal the kind of very nasty products they are using. Uh, in uh, California, there is a case of 20 companies, 22 companies who are also requesting trade secret status to avoid having to make public uh, chemical, uh, toxic chemicals in different uh, cosmetic products. M uh, Monsanto has been using trade secrets repeatedly to, 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 you know, to, to 
counter, counter request to publish the chemicals that they use in some of their pesticides. Pharmaceutical company, of course, you know, they try to use uh, trade secret to prevent drug data to be disclosed or clinical data to be disclosed, which, you know, can have very <laughs> horrible uh, effect for society because then uh, you don't have access to information about side effects, uh, you don't have access to information that uh, make it possible to see, you know, whether or not the drug is really efficient or not. Other risk, you know, may be that, you know, it's used to prevent the action of um, uh, whistleblowers. It's, uh, in France, we had a case recently where it's used to cover up some, some fraudulent or at least unfair provisions in public-private partnership, you know, that may be very important. You know, there are very, PPP are very, you know, all, all over the place. And one of the problems often with that is what is, you know, what are the conditions for the partnership? So trade secret can be used to hide that. And we see also in some countries, and there are concerns now in, uh, in Sweden, that uh, it is used by government to facilitate internet surveillance. And it can also be used by intermediaries, of course. So that's just a couple of examples, you know, to give you a sense of like, the broad <laughs> um, array, array of uh, problems that, uh, that can uh, exist. Other problem we are facing is the way, you know, I was saying this is pushing, you know, people want to go fast with that and, and so they try to be efficient and they come with a lot of, you know, rhetoric and justification and we see a lot of problems with that. And being at the European Parliament is particularly scary because uh, you see the lobbying working on that and, you know, selling their arguments to the MEPs who have absolutely no clue what trade secrets are. And unfortunately, very uh, bad arguments are, you know, are, are finding some efficiency. So one of the common one is to say that it is in, in the interest of SMEs. In Europe, uh, 80 or more percent of the economy is based on SMEs. So of course, you know, we care very much about them, and we want to try to help them. So the common idea is that patent things are very complicated and expensive for SMEs and they, you know, they've shown that they're not so good at using them. So, well, you know, trade secrets is the solution for them. It's going to be the magic solution for SMEs. But it's also the magic bullet for innovation. So the very exact same sentences and, you know, rhetoric we've been hearing for years about patent and innovation, you know, more patent equals more innovation equals more job, you know. It's that simple. Uh, so we've been working for years and years to try to deconstruct that and get policymakers to understand that if you want to boost innovation, it's probably going to be much more complicated than that. Now they come back with the trade secret thing. So, so and we find ourselves in the, this very difficult position where we we are defending the patent system and you know trying to say, oh, of course, you know, it is not perfect, but uh, the patent system, you know, it is, uh, you know, it's uh, it's supposed to be a balanced game where you know. You will reward uh, efforts for innovation and you disclose the information. It, it, it's becoming public. Uh, trade secrets, it is not. And, and so recently I was, uh, we have a jury committee, the, the committee that works on legal affairs inside of the parliament. So of course that's a committee that is going to lead discussion on trade secrets. And since it is new, we ask the secretary to kind of like do the 101, you know, that trade secrets so that members get a basic sense. So they did it. It was partly good, but it was partly very scary. And this is an extract of that document that is now made public, where, you know, they explain how trade secrets is really cool. Lots of advantages in comparison to patents, because you do not need any registration. <laughs> so it is cheaper. Uh, it doesn't have to be really completely new, you know, that's cool. Uh, you can extend indefinitely the protection and you don't have to make anything public. You know. So when we hear that, we're like, whoa, you know, if the conversation is launched like that, that is really a problem. Because trade secret, I mean, is not supposed to be the same thing as patent. We're not going to replace one to the other and then, and then magically get a lot of innovation and jobs. We need, so, the common, uh, the most common uh, argument is, you know, businesses are increasingly exposed to dishonest practices. 
tons of different things, and of course the Chinese, you know, behind that. Well, but, but it works. It's it's bad because it works. And then there is also the figures, you know, bill, billions of euros of damages. We we used to that, you know, in intellectual property, but it's it's again the same thing. So very extreme rhetoric about you know the problems. It ex exaggerated figures with no other figures to counter that and misrepresentation of the reality that is really, really not helpful because, you know, not only are we going to do probably something that is wrong, but also we are not fixing the existing problems. So, uh, predictable risk of errors due to pests. So that's what we are going, trying to do now as Greens in the Parliament, uh, trying to talk with the other political groups to say, look, Let's not go too fast with that. We we need uh, we are not necessarily against the idea of harmonization. You know, maybe, well, we are not totally convinced that it is needed, but maybe. But let's do it properly. You know, uh, we don't want to have an unclear, unclear regulations, and this is now what's what's going on. You know, unclear definition because harmonization is very complicated. Like I said, you know, the countries have very different legal frameworks, so they don't want you know to give up on their thing. So you have to do something a little like blurry and vague so that everybody is happy. That looks to us very dangerous because, you know, likely to result is a, a lot of legal uncertainties and uh, probably very difficult to implement also. Uh, other bigger, big problem it would be too broad of a scope. You know, everything can fall under trade secrets. Uh, we were having, discussing this yesterday in a meeting, uh, you know, in the field of health where you don't want clinical data to all of a sudden be considered as clinical trials, as uh, trade secrets, because they, they are not, they should not be. And we see how big industry can, in many cases, you know, try to push so many different things under uh, trade secrets. And uh, if we are not against trade secret per se, we think there should be a balance. You know, policy makers have to think, you know, okay, they want, if they want to work on on trade secrets protection, fine, but you know, we have all the sets of policies for transparency, disclosure uh, policy that we already in France developed and implemented. We need to pay some attention to the fact that this is not too contradictory and can work together and not undermine or counter the letter with this new uh, trade uh, secrets uh, uh, legislation. So the two basic questions now we have in Europe, or in at least for the Greens, and we're sharing our concerns with other political groups, is uh, do we really need harmonization in Europe? Uh, and can uh, policymakers uh, make their homework so that we have a proper informed conversation on this topic? And of course, you know, those two questions, you know, you know, this is in the context of the negotiation of TTIP, but we cannot just have uh, new EU legislation only because you know some people want to discuss that in DGIP. That's not reasonable. That's it.